Well, this is Memorial Day weekend, a time set apart to commemorate all those people who have died in military service for the United States, and we do honor them. And I don't know about you, but in my family, the commemorating extended to anyone who had died. My grandmother would travel every year from Denver to Superior, Nebraska to buy flowers on Memorial Day and put them on the graves of her parents, her grandparents, and even a few great grandparents. And when she turned 90, she asked my brothers and me if we would drive her there on Memorial Day for what she knew would be one last time to commemorate her people. Now on that road trip to and fro, I heard stories I had never heard before. And um, some of them were juicy. It was fun to hear. She told us about the many gifts that her ancestors had given her. Courage, tenacity, loyalty, and a good sense of humor. So today is a good day to remember family members, biological or adopted. It's a good day to remember those who we've chosen to be ancestors, friends, mentors, and spiritual teachers. So I invite you to just take a minute to bring a few people to mind. And if you'd like, say their names in the chat. Who are you remembering today? We're gonna come back to them in a few minutes, but first I wanna take us back to our oldest ancestors. And you might be doing the math in your head and thinking, well, science offers evidence that Homo sapiens go back about 350,000 years. And if we use an average lifespan of 30 years, that's 11,666 generations. Are those our oldest ancestors? It's kind of cool to think about. Can you imagine that we go back that far? But I want to take us back even farther to the oldest, oldest ancestors, the great apes, chimpanzees and bonobos. We share with them a grandmother who lived six million years ago. Isabel Banke is a primatologist who studies the behavior of the great apes, and she traveled into the Congo to observe bonobos. Her area of focus was very specific. It was play. And she concluded that those ancestors of ours have a lot to teach us about play. Here's some of what she learned by watching them and comparing them to humans. First of all, play creates a capacity for joy. Bonobos show us the evolutionary roots of laughter, dance, and ritual. And just experiencing that liberates them and of course it liberates us. Banky observes how in ancient human communities, festivals full of laughter, joy, and dance were crucial to creating joy and creativity. Secondly, she observed that play is foundational for building relationships. It's a social glue that builds and creates trust. It's where we learn the rules of the game and it generates a diversity of behaviors connections and interactions. Third, play loves creativity, risk, ambiguity, and uncertainty. In other situations, we hate risk. We hate uncertainty. But when we're doing something just for fun, we suspend reality. So things don't usually happen, can happen. We can explore different worlds and build tolerance. In order to adapt successfully in a changing world, she concluded we need play. Now there's another scientist named Diane Ackerman who also studies play. And she says that the more an animal needs to learn in order to survive, the more it needs to play. It's widespread among animals because it invites problem solving, allowing a creature to test its limits and develop strategies and in a dangerous world where dramas change daily, survival belongs to the agile, not the idle. We may think of play as just frivolous or optional or a casual activity, 
But play is fundamental to evolution. And without it, humans and many other animals would perish. So both scientists, Banky and Ackerman, observe that play leads to creativity, fellowship, and wonder. And whenever I see or read that, hear that word wonder, I think of our first source, our Unitarian first source, the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, and may I add even animal cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. So today, going way back to our most ancient ancestors, the great apes, we memorialize and honor them and the ways they evolved and we evolved to play and stay open to wonder. Now we're gonna shift to the more recent ancestors, maybe the people you named in the chat. But before we do, why do we even care? Why do we care about people who came before us? Why do we even care about ancestors? Well, you may know about Beloved Conversations. It's a program for Unitarian Universalists seeking to embody racial justice as a spiritual practice. And that group asked me to record three embodied meditations that would be used during worship during Beloved Conversations and they wanted me to focus on ancestors. Now in their curriculum, they teach that when we forget that we have a heritage, we become cut off from the past and our memory becomes short. We kind of wander through modern life, forgetting that there was anybody ever before us with their foibles and their gifts. And if our memory is short, it can be easy to forget about the future and our decisions can be made without thinking about generations to come. So forgetting about our lineage and what we're passing on can lead us to individualism, which can intentionally or unintentionally lead us to hurt others. So connecting to our roots and our future is important. Acknowledging the mistakes our people in the past made and acknowledging their gifts um, is important. And this is especially for important for white folks like me who live in the United States, who have cut off from our heritage in an effort to assimilate. It's important to talk about our ancestors, our lineage, so that we can become embodiment of more racial justice. Now those roots, as I had mentioned before, can include family, friends, mentors, or spiritual teachers. So I'd like to start by considering our Unitarian Universalist ancestors. Is there anyone in our faith tradition, historical or modern, who has given you the gift of play? Say their names in the chat if you'd like. When you read UU history, I gotta tell you, it's not full of stories about laughter, dance, and ritual. It just isn't. But we know that the transcendentalists who lived in the 1850s found joy and wonder in the natural world. People like Margaret Fuller and Ralph Waldo Emerson. We know that in the 1930s and 40s, Sophia Lyon Foss, who was a religious educator, revolutionized curriculum development, not just for Unitarians, but for the whole country because she centered it in experience and play. There may be others you can think of in our faith tradition, our ancestors who have given you the gift of play. And I need to just tell you all here at Foothills, you are creating a legacy of play. This whole month has been a blast. I've watched all the videos and I love it that you have dedicated a whole month to it. You know, we know from the bonobos, those great ape ancestors of ours, that it's not frivolous, it's essential for survival. And I wanna tell you about a congregation who also has, uh, has had a need to survive this year. Recently, I heard an interview with Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis. Some of you may recognize her name. She's the minister at Middle Collegiate Church in New York City. 
It's a multicultural, multiracial, intergenerational church. And, you know, 2020 was hard, right, for all of us, but especially in the inner city of New York, you know, the pandemic, George Floyd's murder, the rampant racial injustice. And on top of all of that, Middle Collegiate Church's sanctuary burned, caught on fire. And so in this interview, she was asked how she and her congregation survived it. And guess what she said? Play. She said that they have spent years playing together and that has led them to be more adaptable. It's led them to be creative and it has helped them survive. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't wail and grieve and lament the whole year and then the loss of their sanctuary. But she said, we know how to play. And that is how we are surviving. And so Foothills, you are doing the same. You are playing and it's important. Now, back to you personally. Who in your lineage was playful? How did they show up? What did they do that was fun and lighthearted? After the service, we're gonna have breakout rooms and you're gonna be able to talk about that in groups that are small and in breakout rooms. Um, so you'll have a chance to actually pick up on the people that you typed into the chat earlier and maybe talk a little bit about them. But I wanna tell you briefly about my mom. She became an ancestor nine months ago and that woman had duende. I loved Reverend Mariella's sermon about that authentic self-expression that has an impact on the lives of others and helps us connect with our soul. My mom did that. She had duende. Now she was deeply spiritual, but not overly serious. She radiated joy and laughed infectiously. And when we were kids, she made every chore a game. We pretended we were chefs when it came time to cook dinner. She got us toolboxes so we could pretend to be expert home repair staff when it came time to clean and fix things. She took us outside when it rained so that we could watch the worms and she encouraged us to ring, run through the sprinklers. As we got older, she'd push us out the door to the playground or to find pickup games of baseball or kickball. And you know, Banky, that primatologist I mentioned before, learned from the bonobos that at times when it seems to be the least appropriate to play, it's the most important. And that was true. That was true at our house. When someone got hurt, other siblings pretended they were doctors and nurses, and it all turned into a game. And honestly, sometimes when we got hurt, mom laughed. I mean, I don't think she was trying to be mean. She was just trying to relieve the tension. Now, everyone's life comes to an end. Everyone becomes an ancestor at some point. And when mom was in that process, in that dying process, she was not in denial. She knew, she knew she was going and she knew she only had a few weeks and she wanted to play. We were in the midst of COVID, so we all got tested and did the quarantine thing. And then we spent a weekend together and she sat in a lawn chair with her oxygen tank, which she had named Fifi. And we played horseshoes and cornhole and she watched. We had delicious food and loud music and s'mores. And she told us stories that had us in stitches. Poet Greta Josper writes, no careful placement, no artful arrangement, no idiosyncratic whimsy could ever account for the juxtaposition of the strange and wonderful things in our lives. Laughter that erupts in the deepest moments of despair. That's what happened to us. Who has given you the gift of play? And how can you honor them this weekend? Lastly, let's talk about giving the gift of play to the generations beyond us. Now, this is an interesting one for me because sometimes I wonder if I was a good parent when my kids were little. I mean, I'm pretty sure that most parents ask that question or wonder that at some point. 
that time of my life, I was working 60 hours a week in a high stress business setting. My kids, dad and I decided uh, to buy an old fixer upper on three acres of weeds thinking it would be fun. It was work. So I derived this great pleasure from running a business and managing all these house projects and they consumed my headspace. I loved my kids, I took great care of them, but play with them, I'm not sure I did the best job of that. Now, if one definition of play is doing something that's fun with no goal or outcome, well, my world at that time, I mean, everything was a goal. Everything had an outcome. I was efficient because I had to be. And it's not that I wasn't fun. And I'm pretty sure I was funny, dang it. But I didn't get down on the floor. I didn't spend hours on Legos or puzzles. I didn't play school or make believe. And if I did, even just for little moments, I had a list, a list of things to do in my head. Now, when I check in with my kids now, they have very fond memories of their childhood and my mothering. So thank goodness they're not terribly scarred. But something happened a few years back that caused me to reflect on all of this. I got a grandson. And then a few years later, I got a little new nephew and I got a second chance to really play. We play Hot Wheels and Magna Tiles for hours. We play tag and hide and go seek. We build forts and pretend that we live in the woods. When we're in the actual woods, we go on scavenger hunts. We tiptoe quietly as if we are foxes. We use our deer ears to hear, our owl eyes to see, our bear nose to smell, and our raccoon paws to touch. Huxley, my grandson, calls us nature masters. Together, we have a direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder. He doesn't call it that. He calls it play. Our chalice lighting resonates with me so deeply. I love to hear and feel the cadence of children laugh themselves dizzy like swirls of bubbles at play. My daughter, who's 26, Megan, she watches me with these little boys. And one day she said, mom, play is so good for you. You're happy. I cannot wait to have kids so they get to play with you. I hope the generations to come remember me as happy. I hope they remember me as nature master, tiptoeing through the woods, not afraid to get dirty, completely present with them. To whom are you giving the gift of play? And what is one thing you hope they'll remember about you? Each of us is at one point in a long lineage, so many before us. Let's honor the blessings which we've been given. So many after us, let us give the gift and blessing of play. Amen.